When I hear someone is traveling, I usually say, safe travels. Nowadays, I sometimes feel like I also need to say, safe dining as well, which is kind of crazy, right? We're talking health and safety today here on Flying for Flavor. Well, I'm back home now after my little whirlwind wine tour where I went to two different wine events. Hopefully you caught that bonus episode that I just uploaded a couple of days ago. Uh, It's just me talking, not a lot of uh, interviews or outside information, but actually, I correct that, a lot of information. So I wanted to give you an overview of what it's like to go to one of these events in case this is something that you would like to plan around when you want a weekend away, you just want to go and see what it's like, you're planning a girls weekend or something like that. These wine events are a really great starting point. Instead of just going out for dinner, you're actually getting to taste things, sample things, sometimes music, sometimes entertainment, uh, tasting a lot of wines. It's actually a very fun evening. And usually, especially the ones that I go to, I usually go for about two to three hours, depending on the amount of tastings that I can handle or that are available. So it's something I really encourage people to try at least once, especially if you want to develop your palate more and learn more about wine. So we have a lot to get to today. I had a lot of interviews about this topic and I'm going to cram it all into one episode as opposed to trying to split it into two. So we're going to talk food allergies today some other health and safety issues, and I really want to squeeze in a few minutes at the end about travel insurance as well. So before we get started today, I do want to start a new, I don't want to say it's a new section of each episode, but I really follow a lot on social media and I read a lot, especially newspaper, that kind of thing, about food, wine, and travel. And a lot of times there are particular things that I'm reading that I really think that pertain to a particular episode or I think should be made note of. If you don't have the time to start reading all the newspapers and all the online journals, this is a, hopefully I can give you one or two articles in these episodes to get you started on learning a little bit more. So by coincidence, I already had one Globe and Mail article sort of saved link on my computer for today's episode because it was talking about travel insurance. So I'll get to that one later. But then on my way home today, while Norm was driving, I was browsing around online, just making my last minute notes for this episode. And I came across two other ones. So I'm going to leave the links in the show notes for today that you can read them on your own. But it's just crazy about how things are changing. Uh, The first one that I found was about TripAdvisor. So everyone who travels a lot or wants to check on reviews knows about TripAdvisor. They are now going to be putting an icon or a badge beside the hotels where sexual assault has occurred. So you can... See, that is a good thing for those who are trying to uh, find a suitable place to take your family or you're going with a couple of girls or even traveling alone. I can understand that. So right now what they're having is I think it's a very short period of time. They're going to try it for a little while, see how the users like it, how they react, feedback from the hotels and the media, etc. And if it really seems to be something that's more positive than anything else, they're probably going to continue it for a longer period of time. So if you're interested in that, uh, please check out the article. I'll leave the link. It's from the New York Times. It is in my uh, in the show notes. And as always, the show notes are stephaniepichet.ca slash flavor. This is episode 13. So that's stephaniepichet.ca slash flavor 13. And of course, flavor spelt F-L-A-V-O-U-R. Okay, so the other article that I found, which was kind of stunned, so now there's going to be new changes. You know how you have to really check your carry-on and your handbag for ladies on your going onto a plane because there's so many things you can't have because of all these security threats um, that most governments kind of know about but don't want to share it to us, so they make these rules to protect us. I get that. But here's a new one. So small knives are now going to be allowed on planes, but baby powder has been banned. So if you read through the article, again, this is from CTV News. I think they're probably going to have maybe a leather detail or other link or discussions at the bottom of the page. But small knives refers to, it says like six centimeters. I'm thinking, what kind of knife is six centimeters? So now I'm thinking, 
you know, oyster shucker blade. Um, what else? The little blade on the end of a corkscrew might, uh, like a waiter's corkscrew might qualify. But as, aside from that, I mean, not a big, can't even think like paring knife. Like, why would you have to have a paring knife with you? Anyways, so they're allowing that, but then baby powder is not because they can't guarantee what it's made out of. But if you read through the article, it actually talks about how things like protein powder allowed, you know, um, powdered infant formula. So I'm not sure where the rationale is that these things are, of course, allowed in any quantities, but baby powder is not. It's not that I'm a big baby powder user. I just think it was, you know, a little arbitrary that they chose one thing over the other because they're pretty much the same in powder formats. So I'm just trying to think, like if I, not that I would need it, but if I happen to have a, just thinking like you think of that carnation drink stuff powder, or I'm thinking about something simple like, you know, baking powder, baking soda. I don't know. Anyways, it just seems very strange that some are allowed and some are not. But if you want to read more about it, uh, the link will be in the show notes as well. Okay, enough babbling. Uh, Let's get to the first one. And I'm going to try to string these together so that Uh, They come into one section as opposed to me putting a lot of breaks in between. And of course, I'm bringing back my Sudbury secret servers. We start off saying, speaking of gluten free, (laughs) (laughs) this is a good opener for food allergies. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so out of curiosity, how often are people ordering, just because I'm always curious, how many times are people actually ordering things and saying they're allergic to something and you suspect they're not? At least one is I feel that 90% of the time when they tell me that they're allergic to something, it's just because they don't like it. And Would you, you could, prefer them telling you? Most definitely. Just tell me honestly, you don't like it. I'll, it's not going to change my answer. I'm not going to say, well, no. In that case, well, we're not doing it. The worst is when they say it's an allergy and it's not because we take special precautions and it exactly. takes longer for the kitchen to deal with an allergy versus um, a preference. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So if it's a preference, just let us know. We won't give you that item. You know? So for us, well, we have like a whole process we have to go through for an allergy because we have such a, mm-hmm. a strict procedure procedure as well mm-hmm. we have to like for them just to say, for say it's an allergy versus it's something they just don't like the steps we have to go through and the extra time it takes us to go through to make sure for this allergy yeah it would be avoided if they would just say oh i don't like this item and mm-hmm. we'd be easier on the go and everything would be better but that's right oh. Oh, it's good. And the same goes for the gluten. I find a lot of people are saying it's an allergy when really it's an intolerance. And then they would say we would save so many steps if we would just tell us it's an intolerance. <laughs> but. And I think it's partly of an education thing. Um, anyone who has celiac is never going to order something that has soy sauce. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Because they know that mm-hmm. most soy sauces, tamari based, usually have wheat in it. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things like that, the things you, we know that are dusted with flour or whatever. So unless the menu actually says gluten-free, especially when you go to Independence, where it's not a chain, <clears throat> you don't necessarily have specific rules where they have to dictate on their menus, not just calorie counts, um, gluten-free labels, vegetarian or vegan. It's up to them on if they do it or not. But how often are you finding that... <clears throat> Have you ever had a menu having to be changed or menu items having to be changed that you saw because there's such a request for one particular allergy? No. No? No. They just tweak what's already there, maybe? Well, we did add to the like to the keg, we added a special menu for, for gluten um, items so they can order right off there instead of us, you know, going to check with the back constantly, does this have gluten in it, does it have gluten in it? So they did do that, but they didn't necessarily change any items. Or- we- yeah, go ahead. We, I, I worked in a place where we actually have a binder in the back mm. with the different tabs for different intolerances and allergies and such, and what items we recommend you working with from there. Mm. So if they are, for instance, you know, gluten-free, well, mm-hmm. and you're looking for an appetizer, well, these are the appetizers that we'll play with. So you know what I mean? Like, don't try and ask us for gluten-free garlic bread because, you know... The, we don't necessarily carry that. That's not <laughs> probably going to happen. But, mm-hmm. you know, these couple things, if we do this or this to it, you it's gluten-free, and this is what we're offering. At least you're giving them... Um, 
it's always better to say, it's like that glass half full thing, right? Mm -hmm. Here's all the things you can have, yep. as opposed to all the things you can't have. Mm -hmm. And I like, right. that, I like that idea versus showing, like, being like, these are the things in front of you that you can have, mm -hmm. versus being like, well, here's a list of things you can't have, but figure out what you want. It helps right. the servers too, because yeah. when you bring in a new server, on top of having to learn a new menu, which is a lot of work Absolutely. for someone who's never done it before, you know, um, it, it gives them kind of avenues so they're not bugging the kitchen and, you know, hearing the wrath of the kitchen manager or <laughs> bugging a senior server who's busy and doesn't mm -hmm. want to talk to them. And, you know, you miss stuff too in that kind of environment. Things go really quickly, so you may not listen to everything that that new girl just said, but you're just like, okay, do this. And Do you guys knows? have more than one copy of this book? Is it easy? No. 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 So you're it, it is, it is a treasure. It's, it's, I'm assuming it's like chained to the wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it is in the kitchen. And uh, yeah, but there is that, the, but we make uh, part of our training program. It's in the training guide. Oh, so so the they can, goes. you know, when they get it and they're mm -hmm. doing their shadowing and stuff like that, they're, they have, they're are exposed to it. That's good. I mean, the thing is, seems to be the consensus all around is the amount of training that you get and the more information you as servers get mm -hmm. from both sides, from both the kitchen and from the guests, mm -hmm. the easier it is for everybody, right? Absolutely. <laughs> sometimes we'll get, you know, can they not use any steak spice on my steak sometimes? But no, nothing like no, no, yeah. so, no. No, I mean things are unreasonable. Hey, I just ordered a lettuce and tomato sandwich, so you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this past week we had a guest. He, I, I guess he was having a no carb day, but he decided to have a bowl of romaine lettuce with lemon wedges and a plain chicken, no seasoning. And I was like, I mean, I get it, but I mean. It's not exciting. Like, <laughs> let us give you a little lemon oil on the on the salad or something. Like, just jazz it up a little bit. But the, no, the <laughs> hardest situation I've ever had to deal with was someone that came in. They were allergic to butters, oils, gluten, basically everything you cook with. And it was so hard for me to figure out a, a meal for him. I just. I honestly didn't know what to do, so I I was back and forth, running back and forth from the kitchen, trying to, it was the hardest thing to do to please this gentleman, and that's something I'd never want to do again. It was, it was so hard. That's well, garlic for us. Gar yeah? Garlic allergies, because everything has a marinade in garlic, or there's some garlic powder, yes. or some type of garlic in some type of form. Flavor. In everything, yep. it's in everything. So I mean, we do have some kind of go-to things, but when that doesn't please the guest, that's not what they want, well then you're kind of like, well, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm sorry, but... There's only so much we can do. Yeah. And I find sometimes they don't understand, like, not everything's going to mm -hmm. be good for you. I think people have to bear in mind, too, where they're going. I mean, I've had people at an Italian restaurant tell me that they're gluten-free, are allergic to tomatoes, and, <laughs> and lactose intolerant. So no cream, no tomato mm -hmm. sauce, and no pasta. So I'm... I don't know. <laughs> I have vegetables. Yeah. Like, you know, and you kind of feel bad presenting the options that are left, but I mean, mm -hmm. well, that's where you are. Yeah, <laughs> I've done it at an Italian restaurant not that long ago <coughs> where I asked for, I basically took us similar thing. I, I had, they had a gluten-free pasta option. Mm. And then I said, no, I didn't want the cream sauce. I said, just do oil and garlic and then leave all the veggies in. The amount of garlic that I ended up with it was a little crazy because mm -hmm. in the kitchen they were panicked oh. that maybe I didn't have enough flavor because I wasn't having the cream sauce, it. right? But as soon as it came out of the kitchen, I remember it was I had to move my chair back. It's the first thing you smell. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't, don't mind me. <laughs> Their horror stories on food allergies. Mm. The last thing, just because I'm in the same episode, I'm going to be talking about to someone who does first aid. Um, do you find that you're sufficiently trained in first aid? If somebody came in and had an anaphylactic shock, would you know what to do and have everything ready to go? Not because of work. Yeah, School. I would agree. Mm -hmm. well, mine comes from personal experience Me too. and not from from work training. No, mm. I just I've done the first aid program a couple of, like years ago, so mm -hmm. I mean I've gone through that first aid training. But was it for work? Oh, it was. But not for not for I was working at um, a retail store in the mall. I was working at a right. house. But not related to waitressing. Not waitressing, Me but um, it's been probably like seven six years since that. So I mean that knowledge has now kind of dissipated. So 
But no. <laughs> unless I'm wrong, though, I feel like it's something new that started where they have to have people that are first aid certified mm. um, because I feel like I remember them talking about that a few months back where they were looking for the people who had the certification so that they could justify that there was always someone on staff. It's like the, like the old smart serve thing when it first mm-hmm. came out. Remember, yeah. you did yeah. have one person with smart serve. Oh, I didn't know that. When it oh, first yeah. came out. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so I do want to have that discussion. So I am going to be bringing on um, um, a training expert, but I want to talk about, um, so in the same episode, we're going to talk about uh, choking, mm-hmm. um, using EpiPens, right. and all that kind of stuff, things that would happen when you're out and about with guests. <clears throat> and I do know that she tends to offer them to groups of staff, so I'll see what I could do to arrange private training. Interesting. That's good. So there was a lot of good tips that my little secret servers shared some behind the scenes stuff of what your servers and restaurants um, have to go through to prepare for guests who arrive who may have food allergies. So it's something that they're very aware of. And it looks, it looks and sounds like the food service providers are doing even more to protect their guests, protect their staff, just to make it a pleasant experience for everyone. So you know what that sound is? It's time for a fly in my soup. This is the time of the episode where I get to rant a little bit. But since you've already heard about how stressful and scary it can be to serve people who don't tell you about their food allergies in advance, I thought that I'd point out today about when people make a huge deal about an intolerance or a dislike of a particular food when it's not necessarily that serious of an offense. So an allergy is a health concern and it can even be deadly. So it's not really something that you should be fooling around with or making light of or mimicking or faking it be just because you're embarrassed to say that you don't like mushrooms because I've actually seen that happening. However, if you don't digest onions very well, and in my notes I'm writing here, quote, digest onions well, because that's what I've heard um, as an example. You don't have to inform everyone in the restaurant or your guests or dictate to your guests on where they can eat or what they can order. Once, I actually dined with two people who had celiac disease at the same time. That was a very unusual situation, but it happened. One of them quietly informs the server and asks what they could eat. The other person kept the waiter busy for 10 minutes asking 20 questions about the kitchen, the staff, the tools, the cooking methods, etc. For this example, I mean, celiac is serious. I get it. Um, I said I, you know, I have personal family relatives who have it. But I've also seen the same thing in this loud and attention seeking from somebody who just maybe can't eat too much garlic or uh, has trouble or is been feeling kind of ill that day and thinks it might be an intolerance to wheat that day. That's not a wheat allergy unless you've gone to get tested and be so. so making you feel bloated doesn't necessarily mean it's an allergy. So I just want to remind people and maybe if you see somebody or you have a friend who tends to do that once in a while, just remind them to be honest with the people who are serving you food because it's hard on the people who cook for you, the people who serve you, and really it's also kind of hard for the people who have to sit around you. So just be aware of who's around you. So now we're going to go to um, the management of a restaurant just to see what kind of things are actually implemented and how uh, serious management actually takes it. So we're bringing back my old friend Bev Wills from Finn McCool's here in Sudbury just so she can give us her take on uh, food allergies and other scary things in restaurants. Uh, first aid and safety. Oh yeah. So one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is because I know that a friend of mine has a safety training business and uh, she does a lot of first aid and with kids and everything and we were talking about food allergies the other day. And it has to do with a lot of the servers, the three servers I interviewed yesterday, they all told me that they either took a first aid course or whatever. They have some basic knowledge, but it never came from the restaurants they've worked at. Really? It's always been outside. And I don't know like how often, or are you confident as a manager that if somebody had anaphylactic shock, that you would have somebody on staff? Do there certain policies that you have in place? Would you do a training type thing? And it's just because I'm, I'm we're going to do an entire podcast um, 
on this whole idea of first aid and choking and kids and okay. you know burns right yeah, I right. mean we're joking around not joking around but one of the servers was telling a story about how she was coming out with coffee in the morning and there was some little kid laying oh, across the aisle yeah. and she just missed him yeah it's crazy um we have um it's called e-learning in my business so um they have to do these courses online a brand new employee brand new say server let's let's stick with the servers has minimum amount of e-learning that they have to do so working with guests with disabilities uh, safe workplace practices they have to complete those now how well they're paying attention to the e-learning courses i can't control that because i'm not there while they're doing their e-learning but they do have to pass those they do have like little quizzes that they have to do is it enough probably not but i do have um i like i don't i don't have my first aid but I feel that I'm knowledgeable enough but is it enough probably not right so according to the government of Ontario it's not enough and you're supposed to have one person on staff Mm -hmm. for every shift to do that well what if you do like what do you do when you only have when you're down to two people um we have had incidents in in the restaurant where someone has gone into shock they've had their own like they've had EpiPens another time we had to call 911 we have a guy you know and um we so your question is how confident am i i'm very confident because the, always the manager on duty would be able to handle that situation i'm 100 percent confident in that but to have the actual criteria i would say that's something we would need to work on for sure mm-hmm. especially with all the food allergies mm-hmm. i mean one of the conversations we had yesterday was there seems to be a lot of there's which I, I understand. If I have a severe food allergy where I need an EpiPen, I'm going to have it with me. Right. Right. Um, I'm also going to make my server aware that I have a food allergy. Right. Right. But it's becoming more and more of an instance where there's two different things. It's called lack of communication either way. Either somebody who has a food allergy is not telling anyone until afterwards. Right. Right. They get right. served something and then they ask, well, oh, I forgot to ask, is there butter in this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Seriously, you should have asked. Right. Or... On the other side, people are claiming food allergies when there isn't any. Right. And one of their concerns is, especially um, as a server, they're going through all these extra steps and they know they see the kitchen going through all these extra steps to prepare this allergy free, right. you know, dish. And it turns out they just didn't really like mushrooms. Right. So, and it's a pre- so for them, it's preemptive. They just want to make sure they don't get a mushroom or they want to make sure they don't get a tomato on their sandwich. And um, you're that's right. different than I'm allergic to tomatoes. Exactly. So um, we have had it. it so that, that one incident I was just telling you about, um, they did not say that they had a peanut allergy. It's clearly listed on that one item that it's garnished with peanuts. They had a couple of bites and they said, wait a minute is there peanuts on this dish? The server said yes. And they're like, I'm allergic to peanuts. The server, honestly, the first reaction was like, are you kidding me right now? Because it was listed. And I mean, so after she, you know, calmed down, we had to call 911. We had to get that guest out of there. We're like, so the responsibility is on the, the, the guest, but But we take, we take the servers I can tell you are, they're getting more nervous. Oh yes. So because it always falls on their lap and it's their responsibility regardless of how it. So our protocol, let's hope it happens, but our, or that it gets followed. But our protocol is that whenever there's a food allergy, no matter what that food allergy is, you have to make the kitchen aware. So there's a big allergy button, blueberries. We don't have a blueberry in our, our restaurant but you need to tell me that you have a blueberry allergy the guest the server then says there's a blueberry allergy sometimes the cook will be just like okay we're fine but if it's a sesame allergy i'm like i better go and check and make sure there's no sesame oil make sure that there's no it was this bun uh created in a in a facility that has that and they have you know i make sure of that stuff because again i got that culinary background i know how to read labels i know how to go in and i there's food there's menu dishes um that i know 100 percent are peanut free or there's dishes that i know 100 percent that are naturally gluten-free so the celiac can have it the person who's just choosing not to eat celiac then i'll go to the table or celiac gluten yeah. um, i will go to the table and i'll say okay we can't guarantee the deep fryer we can't guarantee that and nine times out of ten stephanie people just say oh that's okay yeah. 
Yes, exactly. It. Yes, oh, I know okay. because I do have relatives who have celiac. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, when they're saying like yeah. I can't have the French fries if they are in the same oil, yeah. then yeah, that that's the difference as right. opposed to oh that's fine. Yeah. Well, we use flour to thicken for the sauce. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. So it's it's frustrating in that regard. We do have um, pans set aside that are are away with their set of tongs wrapped in wrapped in plastic wrap so that when somebody says hey I have a seafood allergy that's the pan that they're going to go and use okay so if you've listened to previous episodes that I've had my chat with Bev we did tape that whole day in my big open kitchen then yes that was the doorbell I had to deliver it on the same time But as opposed to me trying to fight with this software, trying to figure out how to edit it out, I figured I'd just leave it so she can complete her thought because that's the kind of friend I am. Okay, so we're going to go right through to the last interview. This was the person I was referring to for most of this episode. This is Lori Davis. She is the owner of Safety Training Plus here in Sudbury. She does training for, you know, underground and mining and first aid, and she does home alone courses and babysitting courses and just about everything having to do with being safe. Uh, That's what uh, her business specializes in, and it's growing leaps and bounds. So I was lucky enough to uh, take her to lunch uh, about a week ago just to sort of talk about what she thinks is important to know about being safe when dining out and If anything else, or if I had any questions, I thought this was the perfect time to ask her. I didn't get to talk about things like choking and other safety things, mostly because a lot of those require visuals. So I am going to plan another episode uh, with her in the new year where we're actually going to tie in some video links for you in the show notes then as well. So for the time being, we just had to go for lunch and uh, just have a casual chat. So here's Lori. So I wanted to talk about um, safety um, only because there's been a lot of comments about things like food allergies. So we can touch on that first and see how that takes us. So when you are doing training for corporations, public, whatever, how often is food allergies or the topic of coming up in your training? Actually, it's not. I bring it up. I know really? you would think it would come up all the time. No, it comes up when I go through a talk. We have a chapter in our first aid program that talks about allergies, anaphylactic. So then I have to ask people, like, you know, what are you allergic to, anybody in the room? And if I can keep this or not, but I did a, a company here in town, and I said, um, so is anybody here, we were talking about allergies, I said, does anybody here have any allergies? And um, somebody put their hand up, and I said, and this was a company, okay, they all worked together for, found out quite a while. And I said, oh, what are you allergic to? And she went to answer me, and I'm like, stop. And she's like, okay, I'm like, don't answer that question. And I looked at the room, I said, you other 10 people, I want you to tell me what she's allergic to. And they were like, um, um, well, um, I think um, maybe seafood. And I'm like, okay, when you answer it with a question, you don't know. <laughs> and she's like, no. And the health and safety manager was in the room too. So he's just kind of like looking down at his paper. And I'm like, okay, guys, what, what do you think she's allergic to? And someone's like, I know you've got allergies. Um, I want to say um, um, peanuts. And she's like, no. And they're all, I'm looking at them like, guys. And I looked at her, I said, okay, hang on, let's be fair. I said, are you, are you new here? She's like, 17 years. I'm like, okay, guys, this is really bad. I said, you they're like, well, we know somebody, um, somebody's allergic to shrimp in here. And they're like, no, that's Brian. Oh, yeah. I'm like, okay, you guys. Turned out she's allergic to bees and certain medications. She's actually allergic to Tylenol 3. So they had no idea. So one of them says, you know what? In all fairness, though, maybe you should wear a medic alert. And she's like, you mean like this? And she's wearing it. And they're all like, it's so, okay, guys, just stop. You're making yourself look so bad right now. But that's what it is, is people just... If they don't want to, they think honestly that if they tell anybody that they've got this, that they can get fired or something, which is so against the Ministry of Labor. You cannot fire somebody because they have an allergy or they have asthma, but people think this, so they don't say anything, which is brutal because then I'm like, 
Okay, so how many, you know, times have you guys all gone out somewhere with her, maybe outside, do a barbecue or Christmas something? Christmas party. Anything. Well, no, not Christmas party, just because it's um, mostly bees and medication. Okay. But, like, having a barbecue outside, bees can come in everywhere. I so said they were brutal this year. Or how many times have you guys had somebody, your guy that's Brian who's allergic to shrimp, how many times have you guys had a potluck and maybe somebody brought in uh, something that had it in mm. and didn't realize, oh, my God, wait, he's allergic. Kids are amazing. They come to my baby sitting classes they all bring an allergy free lunch it's not kids that are bad it's adults because they don't even realize okay wait and they have no idea they're like okay wait what are you guys allergic to nobody wants to talk about it and it's so scary well i can just imagine on the food service side it's always been pretty scary i mean luckily over the years i never had any major um allergic reactions because i was always i made a point of asking at the very beginning, but it's surprising how many people with the allergies don't tell anyone ahead of time. We'll go to a wedding, we'll go to some place, and they announce it when they get there. You know what? You're right because I've actually, when I do first aid, I do, I do have some customers that are in the restaurant industry, and they tell me every night they're sending a minimum of two, three plates back, and they'll get somebody like say you order surf and turf, I get my chicken for example I'm like oh wait um yeah I, did her surf and turf touch my chicken on the same grill and they're like I don't know why I'm allergic to that well why didn't you say something yeah I know and, and I tell people if I'm allergic to something that is going to potentially close my airway down and potentially kill me I'm going to flash it all across my forehead I'm going to let everybody know but people just don't talk about it anymore and it's bad okay so because you've seen on the other side so what could pe- someone expect someone who maybe doesn't have allergies Right. Who is going out to eat or whatever. What are some of the symptoms or what are the things people can be looking for saying, oh my God, they're having an allergic reaction? Number one is going to be panic. So the people are going to panic right away. Um, and if it, it depends. So there's some allergies that people, when I ask Jeff, they'll say seasonal or whether they get hives and stuff like that. Not that hives is good by any means. But that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for the extremity. Have you seen the movie Hitch with Will Smith? I always bring this up oh, in my classes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. He's full so up like a he, balloon. Yeah. So he, <laughs> these big, big lips coming out. He actually drank, and, and the movie kind of didn't depict it well because he was drinking through a straw Benadryl, he, walking with Eva Menendez, whatever, whoever it was in the movie, um, and he's drinking Benadryl. Benadryl is great because it's an antihistamine, but it's not what he should have used. He should have used an EpiPen. So that's what you're looking for. If somebody's face is swelling, their lips are swelling, likely so is their airway. If they stop speaking? They, if they, they're done, they say, my tongue is feeling funny, they're having an allergic reaction. So right away, I mean, how many people, how much Benadryl do you have on you right now? Yeah, never. <laughs> exactly, right? So chances anybody in this place, I bet you if we ask one person, do you have Benadryl? Nobody has Benadryl. The good thing that people don't know is you can get epinephrine over the counter. Okay. So you can go to any pharmacy, you can talk to the pharmacist, say, you know what, I have allergies. So this is good for people who maybe don't have benefits. It's a little more expensive, but not a lot of drug companies cover EpiPen anyway. Which is crazy. I know. I agree. I think there's maybe one or two, and that's it. They'll do it for kids, actually. They'll actually give kids, like, three, three or four of them. So I have kids that come in my babysitting class. They carry one on them. They've got one at home, and they've got one maybe that they leave at school, which is great. Because they have a one-year shelf life, so that works out. It's adults. And I'll tell people in my class, I'm like, okay, so anybody allergic to, and I go to the top five, bees, you know, seafood, animals, medication, or any certain type, like shellfish, anything like that, anybody allergic, and people will put their hand up. I'm like, oh, great. So it will say to you, oh, great, Stephanie. So what I want you to do is grab your um, medical tag for us, grab your epinephrine out of your bag, come up front, come to the front of the class. I want you to show us how to use it. And I, I do the same thing every class. I'm like, I'll wait here for you to get your stuff, and they're just staring at me, you know. <laughs> Deer in a headlight look, and I'm like, no, no, take your time. We'll get you stuff and come and see me. And they're all like, we don't have it here. I'm like, why? Well, it's at home. Or it's in my car, which you're not supposed to leave it in your car anyway because of the weather. Sure, that's right. And uh, I think maybe, um, I think maybe mine's expired. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? And people just don't. I'm like, so they're like, well, it's $125. I said, okay. 
let's put this into perspective. I said, those are really nice Birkenstocks you're wearing right now. Oh. How much do those cost? And I know how much they cost because of my kids, 125 bucks. So your life is not worth a pair of Birkenstocks? Or I said, when's the last time somebody went out to dinner in the last month? And I asked my glasses and they looked their hands up. I'm like, can you tell us? I said, no, not like a fast food place, like Subway or something that, something that was, you know, expensive. And they're like, I went to a such and such restaurant. And yeah, my bill is about $90 for two of us, you know, dinner and a glass of wine or yeah. something. That's standard. That's a yeah. normal size bill. Your life has to be worth that. So I think that's what we need to educate people on. And that's what I do in my first aid class. I'm like, guys, your life has to be worth more than dinner or a pair of shoes. And it's just people just let it lapse. Do they think it's also because when they leave the house, they or just assume that everybody else will have it covered? Right? Like if they go to some place, they're going to have something there or they're going to be trained in it. Right. You know, is that where they're kind of Maybe, being lax but on it? They shouldn't, though, because I guarantee you, you ask anybody, like we're in a restaurant right now chatting, you ask them to go look in their first aid kit and ask them if they have epinephrine in it. I will bet you dollars to none they don't. No, nobody's going to have it. It's up to you as a person that needs it. You should be carrying it. So why are you leaving it at home? Why are you not carrying it with you? Why, you know, someone says to me, oh, well, I, um, I haven't, I, I avoid bees. If I hear that one more time, I think I'm going <laughs> to lose How do you, how do you avoid mind. them? I know, right? I got stung three times this summer because my neighbor had a bee's wasp in her, in her tree. I'm like, or a nest. And I'm like, okay, how do you, you guys, you can't avoid them. You, as much as you say. And I had, um, I, I've been with people in restaurants where, you know, we're eat at a conference and they're eating something. That's the worst is a conference because at least at a restaurant it gives you an ingredient. But when you go to a conference, you have no idea what they're serving you, that's right. and you have no idea how it was served. So she's like, uh, "My tongue's feeling tingly. My tongue's feeling tingly." I'm like, "Okay, what's going on?" And she's like, "I'm allergic to apples." And we were having this some it was some dessert thing, and so we like the waitress, the surfer down. I'm like, "Is there apples in that dessert?" And she's like, "I don't know." I'm like, "Okay, well, we need you to find out." And it turned out that there was. Somebody had Benadryl. Um, somebody else had an EpiPen. Can they use it on her? Yes. They're not geared for just one person. Oh, that's handy and, to know. Yeah, so they're not geared to one person, and they're also not a cure. No, it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary 20-minute fix to get you to emergency services. Gotcha. To get you to the hospital. You're supposed to take you and your EpiPen to the hospital. In 2016, they changed the rule for epinephrine. So it used to be, you took the pin, you injected it, you wait, you're supposed to hold it for about 10 to 20 seconds, because if you don't, it's not going to come out of the pin, and then you had to wait 20 minutes. If you're in severe allergic reaction, which Will Smith was on that movie, that was really bad. I mean, his eyes were like swollen shut. Everyone's going to look up that yeah, movie now. Yeah, I know, he was going to be like, I want to see that movie. Um, but something like that, you're allowed to take it within five minutes, but people okay. just don't realize that. But who carries two pins on them now, right? Because... I just, but again, I mean, if it's something that, if your airway is closing, you're, you've only got four to six minutes of not, you're going to pass out. You're going to stop breathing. You need to fix this. And you cannot go into any restaurant in town and think, yeah, the wait staff has an pit. That's not even logical to think. No, that. and not to mention it just by coincidence, my Sudbury secret servers that I interviewed when I asked them about it, a lot of them have. They said, remember I told you, they have taken, um, they all have their first aid by coincidence. Right. But they said, it's not everyone who they work with does that right. knows what to do. And they said, and none of them got their training at the restaurant. They just happened to get their training oh, elsewhere. have it going and, in. Yeah, yeah. So had that going in. But you can't just assume that everyone knows what to do. I bet you there's people who don't even know where their first aid kit is in a restaurant. And, and that's not just restaurant, that's anywhere. I yes, mean, like when I go into companies and I audit a first aid kit and I open it and I have to go and blow the dust off of it, I'm like, hey guys, when have you audited this thing last? It's supposed to be audited every month. And when you open it and everything falls out at you or you open it, I'm like, oh, look at two Band-Aids. You know, and it's just things that people don't realize. No, you need, and yes, epinephrine's not part of a first aid kit necessarily, but you can make it part of a first aid kit. And I know companies that have. Companies that have invested in defib machines are for cardiac, that's for a reason. If you have a public place, there's nothing wrong with buying a def uh, an EpiPen. I mean, it is a taxable benefit, like it's a business expense, mm -hmm. and you never know when you're going to use it. I mean, you just, you don't know. People, and I'm sorry, but I've been to a lot of restaurants. I've been to a lot of restaurants in Sudbury with you. Yes. And how many times are we asked at the beginning of a meal, do you have any allergies? 
Uh, rarely, very rarely, yes. right? And it's not to criticize anybody, but it's not their responsibility. If you have an allergy to shrimp, it's up to you to tell the server, I'm allergic to this and this is what could happen. But even I've been to just like Subway and somebody will say, oh wait, um, I'm allergic to, to tuna. Okay, no problem. And they'll get a new knife and they get new paper and yeah. they clean it off. But had that customer not said to that person, um, you know, I'm allergic. Can you get a new knife? And they're very calm. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But they don't know what they don't know. You, if you have the allergy, you need to be talking about it. You have apps on a lot of phones now, like our iPhones have a medical alert app. They do. So it's got the heart. Put that in there. Because even though you can't go into somebody's phone if it's locked, EMS can click on that in an emergency and see all your allergies, especially medication. Oh my God. Medication, don't even get me started on medication. <laughs> I have had so many people argue with me in my classes, but I don't need to advertise a medication because the hospital knows what I'm allergic to. I'm like, seriously? Okay, that's fine if you're living yeah. in a hospital. Okay, seriously? Exactly. <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, so you're in an accident. Half the ambulances have almost the same medication as Emerge. So they give you penicillin and you're allergic to it. What happens? Like, they don't have, they're not allowed to go through your wallet. They don't have time for that. And they give you something that they think. I said, what if you're unconscious? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What, what do I mean? You, what if, if you're you unconscious? Yeah, you what if you're on the highway? Slip and fall. You're, um, you're going to Toronto. And you get into an accident on the 400. I said, do you think they call us every hospital? Hi, can you tell me if Lori's <laughs> allergic to penicillin? <laughs> they don't do that. I said, you can't put that on the hospitals. You have the allergy. You need to be medical alert. I don't know. It's a fashion thing. I'm telling you, it became a fashion thing because every time I ask my students who have the allergies, I'm like, where's your medical alert tag? Well, it broke. It's in my jewelry, jewelry box. And I'm like, Shoppers Drug Mart sells it. You can go get it engraved. Get a tattoo. Oh, tattoo is yes. a cool idea. It's a great idea. Just tattoo penicillin. Penicillin. All you have to write is a short form of penicillin because paramedics will still pull the shirt down to check for necklaces. Guys commonly wear necklaces and they'll check their wrists to see if there's something written on it. Write it down. Diabetics are great at wearing those, but not people who have allergies. And then someone says, well, put the number for, you know, no, put down what you're allergic to. Yeah, don't, yeah we don't have to call somebody. Don't call, so you have time for that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right? So just put down what you're allergic to because... If you're going to give me a medication and I'm unconscious and it's going to do further damage to me, um, I want you as a paramedic to know that. You don't have time to go look through my phone or maybe car accidents, phones get thrown or people have found phones two days later, at the, you know, underneath a car seat or something or, you know, when you have a damaged vehicle. You don't have time for this. Know ahead of time. And you can't rely on the hospital records. You can't put that on them. No. No, it's not fair. You need to, and I don't know why people just, they're just like, oh, I avoid it. I don't know why people just, you can't always avoid things. Like, you don't always know when you can go to somebody's house and say, you know, if you came to my house and I knew you wanted to the shrimp, I'm not going to cook with shrimp. But again, how many trade shows have you gone to? How many, this is why at Costco, take, let's say Costco, they won't let a child take a sample without a parent there. It's A, it's a choking hazard, and B, it's to make sure the parent says, yes, he can have this in case it's an allergic reaction. Oh, it absolutely. takes the onus off them, and more people need to be more diligent like that, and they need the onus has to start with you first. Now that we went into that deep dive into food allergies, let's talk safe travel. So I don't want to... Over exaggerate, but I think that travel insurance is probably one of the most important things that people overlook. There are all kinds of stats and things that I read about how only maybe a third of travelers actually travel with travel insurance. And I think that is scary to think about it because you don't know what you're going to run into. And especially as Canadians, we are so accustomed to having free health care, having access to any kind of medical advice, being able to walk into any clinic at any time, being close to our home, family and friends and familiar surroundings, that we just think that we are indestructible and that we can probably just handle that week in Mexico without it. So I do want to take a few minutes and talk about 
travel insurance. So now it's not just for out of country travel, uh, which is not what people uh, think about, but it's actually even going from province to province or anytime you get on a plane is usually my rule of thumb. So travel insurance, you can get uh, mix and match packages depending on the insurance provider, but you're looking at things like triple cancellation, trip interruption, lost baggage. So it's happened before, even going from here, from Sudbury to Toronto, my bags went elsewhere, my insurance will cover that if I've got lost baggage as part of my travel package. Um, Health coverage is not always included as well, so that's a separate one. And especially if you're looking for out of country. Not every country has great health care or has free health care, especially for non-residents or non-citizens. So you need to check on the destination where you're going before you leave. Uh, Actually, long before you leave. Please don't do this the day before. Check and see what your current policy covers if you already have one. And then sometimes you only, certain things are covered and you may need to top up. And it's always just good to double check about what you need versus what you have and then fill in the blanks from there. So my plan is through our credit card and our bank. And it's an all-inclusive package. So it covers a trip cancellation, trip interruption, baggage, health coverage, etc. But because we pay, we travel so often, we actually pay annually for our plan and it just renews every year. But if you only travel occasionally, it might be better or more economical to only add on the insurance coverage as you book your flight or vacation package. More and more people are booking online on their own as opposed to necessarily going through a travel agent or doing the research. But even if you wanted to go to an online travel site to book a package or a flight just to check out pricing and then use a travel agent later, every time that you go through a, you pretend like you're going through the booking process to see what the final price would be, there's always, always an option for adding on travel insurance. And you'll actually get to see the breakdown of the different coverage options available and the corresponding prices. So do some research in advance so you can get the best fit for your budget, your travel and health needs. Travel insurance is not something that you can pick up when you get there. You can't just do this as an afterthought. And you really don't want to end up like the couple from Saskatchewan, who I just read about, who ended up with a $950,000 bill because she had her baby way earlier than anticipated while she was in the U.S. She went to Hawaii for a vacation, probably a baby moon, And she, uh, although she had coverage, or so she thought, it wasn't for, she was declined for what they call a pre-existing condition. You can read the entire article. I left it in the show notes. But she had a bladder infection at the four-month mark of her pregnancy. Doctor didn't think it was a big deal. Doctor told, told her she could go ahead and travel. So it wasn't a question, but that little bladder infection that she had, because she didn't read about her policy, it was considered a pre-existing condition, or that's what they called it. And so they didn't cover her for anything to do with the pregnancy while she was traveling. I mean, you don't, you would never think that that would be an issue, especially if you think your doctor is giving you the okay. But that's part of the issue with travel insurance. Your doctor is not the one who's going to be paying you the money or replacing anything or helping you at the time. It is going to be the travel insurance company. So they are the ones that have to make the decision about whether you can travel or not. So that's why it's very important. So you can read that Global Mail article um, in the show notes uh, for today's episode. Once again, it's stephaniepichet.ca slash flavor13. In closing, I want to say, of course, my thank yous. So thank you to my secret servers. Uh, I think that's probably the last one that I had taped of our little luncheon. So I'm going to have to plan a new one. If uh, you happen to be a restaurant server and you want to join in the fun for uh, the 2018 crew, Um, even if you're not even from Sudbury, because you know, I do travel quite a bit. So if you're down in Toronto and Ottawa, Montreal, uh, anywhere in between, uh, let me know and I can gather some other restaurant servers and I think it'd be fun. And yes, I pay for lunch. So thank you in advance uh, for sharing all of your little insights and stories. I really appreciate it. Thank you to Bev Wills, of course, from Finn McCool's. And of course, to Lori Davis of Safety Training Plus. The links to uh, her business, of course, if you're interested in getting courses here in Northeastern Ontario, you can get that link in the show notes as well. So if I want to thank you, of course, for listening and thank you in advance for sharing this episode and the podcast with your friends, family and coworkers. 
This episode is probably important if you know somebody who you've been trying to convince to either be healthy, be safe, get travel insurance, or take care of their food allergy, or just to be cautious about it, or maybe has been newly diagnosed with a food allergy. But the more that we share or that you share this podcast and certain episodes with more people, the more people are going to hear about it, the more people I can get uh, on board for interviews, the more staff I can bring on so that I can do more production. There's just so many possibilities where this podcast can go. And uh, it all starts with awareness. So the more people you tell about it, the more people you share it, the more people you can comment on it, share the Facebook page. Of course, I'm on every, um, most of the main social media channels. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And please subscribe to iTunes or Stitcher if that's where you're listening from. So you can get things like those fun bonus episodes that I'm going to pop in here and there. And no, they won't always be about wine. So we'll chat again uh, next weekend. It's starting to snow here in Northern Ontario. So if you're not here and not seeing snow, you're lucky. So, <laughs> and if you're enjoying the snowflakes and you're getting excited for the holiday season, um, enjoy it too. I'm going to be cooped up this weekend uh, in my house trying to pretend it's not snowing. Uh, so take care and we'll talk to you next weekend.